Hello and welcome to a Sunday night edition of the Managing Madrid Podcast. This is your host, Keon Sabani, joined by Matt Wilsey tonight. We are recording this almost two and a half hours after Real Madrid lose to the to Barcelona at the Camp Nou in a Clasico, in a league that was already lost, and now it's not only lost, it's just in a coffin and buried deep underneath the earth, and it will never be retrieved. Real Madrid are not winning La Liga. That's it. Uh, Matt, someone... Before the game, ask me on Instagram Instagram Q and A's whether I think that if Real Madrid had a, can win tonight, if we have a chance at the title, and I said no. But the importance of winning tonight is not that it claws you back in the league; it's a psychological boost. That's it. It takes you to maybe another level of confidence heading into the games against Chelsea. Maybe it, you know. Um, also plants more seeds of doubt into Barcelona for that Copa del Rey clash, the second leg happening in April at the Camp Nou, all that stuff. But we didn't get it. And I, I don't know, like the second game in a row, Matt, Ancelotti comes out after the game and says a bunch of things where it seems like they're drawing confidence from it. And I don't know, like how, I don't know where that confidence necessarily comes from. I do not think Real Madrid deserve to win tonight. Um, but Carlo is back on this trend of taking these moral victories. I kind of feel like this is a more of a big picture podcast, Matt. Um, because and, and, and kind of disappointing because we got, what, 12 games to go? And every single La Liga post-game podcast now is just a big picture podcast, which shouldn't be the case with this many games to go. Is it 12 games? I think it's 12 games. It's incredible and inexcusable that you can just lose two classicals in a row, row three, uh, three in a row actually, if you if you count the uh, Super Cup, and then take all these moral victories and then tell yourself everything's okay and you've already lost the league when it's mid March. That doesn't sit well with me. I don't like the fact that Carlo Ancelotti took this in an entirely positive way post game, um, and I'm just kind of disappointed with the whole thing, Matt. Yeah, honestly, I think it, it's shameful that he's he's talking like that after both of these Classicos where we've lost and we really haven't been good enough. We haven't played well enough, and that's that's the fact of the matter. And no fan is happy seeing Carlo come out and say, oh, we played well, we should have won, we should have done this. Like, no, that's at the end of the day, he's – the process we we like to talk about the process over results, but even the process here was not good. Like the performance was not good in this game. You could argue that okay, maybe the last ten minutes when we really started to get going, but though you should have been playing like that from the outset, and a lot of those players that were on the pitch at that time should have been there from probably from the starting, um, from from the start of the match, and so that's where I think it's getting really frustrating. For, for everyone involved with Real Madrid. Like, it's the same mistakes over and over again from Carlo Ancelotti. And, and now it seems like we, prior to Xavi's arrival, we had this foothold on, on the Clasico. And what was it? Like seven in a row without uh, defeat. And now it's three successive that Xavi's won. And honestly, it's Xavi outclassing Ancelotti every single time. And I don't know if Ancelotti's overthinking it or maybe even underthinking it, if that's a terminology, but I just feel like he's he's getting it so wrong. And we often like to start with the starting lineup. For me, the starting lineup was was wrong today. You just came off the g- game against Liverpool. Um, you know you've got some older heads in your squad, i.e. Carvajal, Modric, Bruce, Benzema. And you go out and you play the exact same lineup. And you're not even the least bit surprised that we lacked energy out there. Every single transition was just Vinicius and Benzema out there by themselves. Nobody else could get up there. Nobody else could get up there in time to support them. Barcelona was able to get all eight players back and set up shop versus our two offensive threats. And nobody else was able to get up the field. It was extremely frustrating and you just think to yourself, we needed that. We needed, you just needed energy today more so than like anything. Um, and you needed to compete and we didn't. And I think I, I like you've seen it with like Chavi clearly funneled 
all of Barcelona's defensive shape and their press to dictate towards the right side of our pitch and get the ball to Carvajal and Fede Valverde, i.e. mostly Carvajal, because he spotted Carvajal as the weakest link. You pointed out that Carvajal had the most touches in this game um, uh, on Twitter, and I later pointed out that not only did he have the most touches, but he had the most turnovers, 23, which was far and away the highest on the field, almost double anybody else. And that signals to me a clear, clear tactic from Xavi. He said, let's funnel everything towards that right side of the pitch. Let's get Carvajal in a corner and let's have him cough up the ball and we'll go right down their throat. And it was the same thing over and over again, whether it was Carvajal coughing it up, Fede was really, really poor on the ball. That right side was non-existent. And then you had Courtois when he would get under a little bit of pressure, just lump it up the field and then it would come right back down our throats again. So it was frustrating to watch. And I think Xavi really pinpointed Real Madrid's weaknesses and just went after it. Well, Carvajal against Liverpool was the one guy who was not good. And then tonight, I mean, he was he was brutal to the point where every time he had the ball, I just was I, I actually took note and I gave up taking notes. It was like minute after minute. Every time he was pressured, and sometimes when he wasn't pressured, he would lose it somehow. He was not taking care of the ball at all. His passing was lax. His touches were bad. Uh, just a brutal Carvajal game again. This is not a unique unique situation where Carvajal is not playing well. This has been a long time now. By the way, like you know how, how reactionary I love being after a classical loss. This one I really feel like is not a reactionary take. You can't you can't look at this game and also all these Carvajal games and in the summer tell me the fact that we have too much sentimental value. We have to keep these Vasquez and Carvajal contracts, not to really drag Vasquez into this port. He didn't even play today and he's not even a right back. But you can't look at this Carvajal situation and be so attached to him sentimentally because of what he's done in the past and not upgrade that position. It's inexcusable to me. <clears throat> um so that that's just that was just a really really poor, another really really poor Carvajal game. The starting eleven, I I mentioned it after the Liverpool second leg, because we were talking about you know I don't think you were there on that one I think it was Ewan. And I did mention like yeah, Real just midfield looked good in that game. But we have to remember that you're playing one of the weaker midfields you're going to play in a long time. They had Cody Gakpo in there, Thiago injured, and it's already a brutal midfield to begin with. It's not going to be like that in Classico. Granted, Pedri wasn't even playing today. And the funny thing is that the way we lost these two Classicos were completely different. In the first, I'm not sure how I would prefer to lose. In the first game, in the first leg, at the very least, our defense was good because we just did not let Barca even enter our enter our half. The one time they did, they scored, and they had another one where they they missed. But they had they conceded two chances in that game. This game, we had more chances than we had in the first game, despite having less of the ball. But we were also open defensively, and I think Courtois said that after the game, like we we put numbers up and we risked it, and uh, we paid the price for that. It got us better opportunities. But the thing is, like, I don't know, like, when we say we risked it, we weren't, all we were doing was just having transition attacks. So I don't know where everything, where our structure was in between. And I just want to go back to the starting lineup for a sec. I don't understand the obsession with if Benzema can breathe, he has to play every second. And I said it before the game. So I just want to point out that I said it before the game and I'm not reacting to it after the fact. Before the game, I said, if Benzema's not 100%, don't play him. I don't Even if he's 99%, I wouldn't have played him. This game did not require that that for us to, to shoehorn him in and play him in this game. Uh, to continue on that point, I thought Benzema, along with Carvajal, was our worst player on the field today. He killed so many of our attacks with his passing and his decision-making. And he continued to stay on the field until the end. On the flip side, Kamavinga, I thought, was yet again another really good performer. One of the bright spots that can actually hold his head high. And he, I think, deserved to see out this whole game until the end. 
And you can say, well, you know, we subbed off, we subbed on like our entire B midfield. Who who you keep on? You can just take Benzema off, put Rodrigo as the false nine, and let Kamavinga continue to be a real big problem for Barcelona. They had didn't really have answer for his verticality. He was really good on the ball. He always tried to progress it. Uh, he was strong and he and he covered well defensively. So I think there's a lot of things in there. And by the way, when Carlos says we deserve to win, I don't know, like. I don't know where you are on that. You're shaking your head, so I'm assuming you. Know no, I don't know that. what game he was watching <laughs> when he says that. Our XG tonight me. was 0.52. Now you can argue, like, okay, we had. I mean, but even if you look at the field tilt, that was in Barca's favor. Maybe in his eyes it was like, or or maybe he's making it up and is just trying to convince his team something. But. The only thing I can think that maybe he saw was we had a few transition attacks that we could have scored from. He feels the Asensio goal may not have been offside. Moments like that, but but Kian, the point the point five two. If you look at the shots, almost I would say ninety five percent of it comes from after the Rodrigo substitution, yeah. and then and then all all of it's like a late flurry. It's that Chuameni. Sh- it's the Benzema shot, which led to the the Chuameni rebound. Um, it's Asensio's shot, and it's Rodrigo's shot inside the box. Like those are the big ones, and um, all of that comes at. Like I'll admit, yeah, that ten minutes was was really really strong, and after that, or, or sorry, that ten minute period when the substitution all that he made all those substitutions when we played our best and we finally went for it and that's when it felt like okay this team's playing like la liga's on the line for 60 yeah. 70 minutes we were acting like la liga's <laughs> not on the line like we literally had we it seems like we were okay with a draw or we were okay with with losing like there was just no urgency it felt like there was no intensity to our game the first five minutes of the second half i was pulling my hair out because we we're just letting we we're letting barcelona yeah, play through us. Um, so I just, I uh, yeah, one, I don't agree with Ancelotti's comments, and two, I think that flurry or that the XG that we talk about all comes from a very small segment of the game. Here it is. So I'm sharing my screen for those who are watching on YouTube. It this is the flurry right here. Yep. These blue bars are us. You can see basically it's mostly Barca throughout the game peaked really like a lot in the second half actually you mentioned the first five minutes like i was like i was so disappointed with our response at halftime yeah that we didn't change anything which kind of confirmed to me what is always the case in games like this carlo thinks it's working when it's really not and and we just came out really letting barcelona have the ball the whole second half that pin like we think of that as like oh that this is us playing counter-attacking football we're letting them knock the ball around when in reality, what I think happens is that you sit so deep and the momentum between both teams, the gap increases yeah. because Barcelona knocked the ball around. They gain confidence and Real Madrid get pinned and they can't escape. And we like our right side was really brutal escaping pressure. Carvajal yeah. was brutal. I mean, the town wasn't great either, um, to be quite honest. But Carvajal was obviously the big one that really struggled. But this is the flurry right here. And. It confirmed to me what you and I have been saying for a long time. Rodrigo needs to play. Yes. Well, Kian, this is like, and not to toot my own horn, but it's something all fans have seen. So it's not like this big revelation. But I wrote an, a piece after the last Classico on like how to unlock Vinicius versus Araujo. And a big part of that was you need Rodrigo on the pitch to offer uh, an additional outlet. One, because he can provide threat from the right. Or he can come in centrally and provide overloads on the left. And then you also need Kamavinga at left back because he can provide, he's a third option where those three can interchange. He can provide overloads, drag defenders away. What happened on on the goal today? It was the one moment where Kamavinga does an overlap, drags a defender. He picks up the ball, kind of does a quick combo with Vinicius. Vinicius gets it back. Araujo is a little bit out of position. And that's how we score. And then Rodrigo comes on, immediately makes a difference, immediately. And he got to play in that number 10 position. 
Uh, you saw him combine with Vinicius and Benzema. He had that one opportunity that we talked about that he really should have taken. And here's my thing on Rodrigo, because I know there's, I feel like the fan base is kind of split on Rodrigo. And I know you and I are very high on him and um, feel he should be starting at this point. But I know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, he hasn't scored in La Liga since what, October or whatever it may be. Um, but I I really think it's, you kind of go back to the ketchup bottle analogy that Ruben Istero used to say, like right now, Rodrigo's dramatically underperforming his XG. Um, you look at just his, his numbers, his non-penalty XG and expected assists. He's, he ranks in the 90th plus percentiles for, for wingers. Like he is a top, top player. I actually like, you hear a lot of people talking about uh, the Napoli winger. I'm not even going to say his name. I'm going to call him like Carva or whatever it is. Kavara. <laughs> um, like you hear a lot of people like yearning for him and you look at his numbers. They're not that different from Rodrigo. They're very similar players. And I, you switch him, you put Rodrigo on that Napoli team. I guarantee you he's putting up the same numbers and give him the same amount of starts and um, the same amount of responsibility. Guarantee it. I, I'm that confident in Rodrigo. Like look at their numbers. They're not dissimilar. And Carver's just overperforming his XG right now. He's never scored this many goals in a season. Um, I I just think Rodrigo's in a bad finishing form right now, but you see what he brings to the table. You see that solo run against Atletico Madrid, the quality he has. Like He can be a difference maker. He can unlock defenses. He gives defenses something else to think about rather than just Vinicius. And we, with the way Benzema is playing right now, you need Rodrigo on the field. Um, yeah, I mean, I the only thing I think, well, Kavara's his numbers are better. Um, but I think to your point, I think Rodrigo is one of those players that just needs to be on the field more, and you'll get more production from him. He is. Just of like his intent is always there. And I mean, he's it's very interesting again. Like, this is way more than last season. Like, in the past, if he ever got subbed on the right wing or wherever he's on the field, he would play as a right winger. This season, it's totally different. I mean, check his heat map today again. Everything was through the middle. His first touch was a through ball down the middle to Vinicius in transition. His second touch was a shot that basically fell in his lap that he should have tested the keeper in, which he didn't. Um, but there is a line breaking to him and um, uh, like there were so many times in this game where Benzema would get the ball in those same positions and he would make the wrong pass or just, or just literally give the ball away. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to see more of Rodrigo is because I didn't really understand why we need to have Benzema on the field at all times, especially when he's struggling, especially when he's physically not at his best. I really think there is a case to play Rodrigo more. I also want to say that I feel like there is a di- different kind of fluidity to our attack when he plays that central role. Think back to that Celtic game where he was playing in the middle. You know, that's probably the uh, the example that's the best, but it's also not the strongest opponent. But I do think you should just try it. I mean, like you mentioned Fede Valverde and Carvajal being poor today too. Fede was another one that was poor, you know, along with Benzema and Carvajal. If we're not getting enough production from that third attacker and you're not benching Benzema, I really think you have to play Rodrigo more. You really do. And um, again, I, I just think I, I put it as a caution, a cautionary tale for everyone who was high on the starting lineup or, or the midfield against Liverpool. Just that that Liverpool team is not going to be the best midfield. And I think there's yeah. going to be rude awakenings coming. And I think and, and and in some ways, I think we're lucky that we drew Chelsea. I'll knock on wood. You know, who knows? Might come back to bite me for saying that. But if you, once you get to, like, the cities and Bayerns, it's going to struggle again. And you're yeah. going to have to rely on the bench players to come in. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and that's what worries me. Because, I, because I'm really worried that in Carlo's mind, this is really working. Yeah. No, that liver, there's a reason why Liverpool are almost in oh. mid-table in the EPL and Yes, they're struggling with injuries, and yes, they've got some new players that are trying to integrate, but that midfield is not a quality midfield, and they basically tried to play a 4-2-4 four, four, 
you mentioned Gakpo like dropping in, but you were playing a 2v3 most of the time in midfield. And so, yeah, Modric and Cruz are going to look like Don- dynamite in that type of scenario. And um, I just hope it doesn't, like, I hope that game doesn't give us false confidence. Um, and I feel like maybe it's done that for Carlo. Like, yes, Modric and Cruz are still among the best in the world, but we've seen that we need to continue to integrate others. And we don't know that this team, a lot of the players on this team are capable of playing three ninety high intensity, 90 minute matches within seven days, which is what happened this week. Um, like a guy like Carvajal, I know you and really talked about how he was surprised Carvajal played on 90 minutes against Espanol. And then he goes and plays 90 against Liverpool. And now he plays 90 against Barcelona. And we see, we see how gassed he was at the end and part of the reason why we gave up that late goal. But um, before I get too far down the line, I wanted to go back to your comments on uh, Kamavinga. And we talked about like Rodrigo's impact and you said you would have kept Kamavinga on the field. And I agree with you. I think, I think a lot of the substitutions were, were the right substitutions, but I think the personnel maybe should have been different. And for example, I probably would have moved. Yes, you're worried about how well Rafinha is playing 1v1. Um, but I think you got to take the gamble and move Kamavinga to left back. Uh, we needed, at this point, La Liga's on the line. You have nothing to lose. You need to win this game to have any chance. Like, take the risk, put Kamavinga at left back, put Chiuameni in there. I think Ceballos should have come, come on earlier. Um, I, I thought both Ceballos and especially Asensio looked really good. Yeah, they, they, um, the bench, the, all the bench players I thought looked good apart from Yeah, many. Chua many. I thought Chua many. I know I've been critical of him. I thought Chua many looked great. <laughs> like I know, I honestly, I think this was like one of his. You best know, it's a bad day looked. for Matt when <laughs> lose classical and Chua many played well. Terrible. Then Matt's not going to sleep all tonight. Yeah, <laughs> I really like. I thought he came in and just put a bunch of crunching tackles in, won the ball high up the field. Like we kept Barcelona a lot. It was the first time it felt like we kept Barcelona a lot locked in their half for a bit. Um, and Asensio, even after his goal was disallowed, you saw him do that turn kind of in our own half. I think he put his body into Balde and still managed to wriggle away. Um, Busquets, there was a couple of times where Busquets tried to just take him down in transition and wasn't able to. Like I thought that's the type of player we want to see Asensio be like have a chip on his shoulder and really make an impact in games. And I thought it was a great cameo from him. All the subs, all the subs were good. And it just kind of makes you question why some of them weren't in earlier and why some of them weren't starting. So the, this all, this entire theme so far has been that our performance peaked when the subs came in for a brief period and quite frankly, you know, it may they may have sought it out. If the Asensio goal was not offside, they may have just won that game. And this the the tone of this podcast would have been completely different. But but because um I mean you I laugh, don't know that it would a, be that different no, but, though. But I don't think did. it would be different. Because I wasn't happy with the performance even when we scored the two one. Like I still thought we played terrible. Yeah, no, I just mean it might be a little bit happier, that's all. Yeah. Um I think you and I would still analyze the process. But I think the the fact that the performance spiked when those subs came in, I wonder how Carlo reads that. And c- because I remember saying that because I've gotten some shit for saying that Cruz and Motors can't play together in big games. And I just want to keep clarifying that I have no, I, those, both of those players are amazing players. I think they're actually both having really good seasons. But the pairing together has been problematic. And someone pointed out, like, you're wrong because we won the Champions League last year with them starting. Without failing to realize, this is the stat. Uh, when we... that Getting to that Champions League final and that run to it, with them on the field, um, we, we have a negative goal differential of six in that run. And when the subs were made, that's when we scored all our goals and stopped conceding. That's just what the numbers tell us. And it backs the eye test of like these guys, we struggled when with the starting lineup and the game flipped on its head that every every time Carlo made his subs. And I was kind of worried that 
he was going to react way too late in this game. Um, thankfully, he reacted. I mean, it didn't matter. We still lost. But like in that first leg of the Copa, the 80th minute is when the subs came in because he felt like it really was working. Um, so I, I guess I'm just starting to lose sight of what he actually values when he says we played well because he felt like we played well when we didn't create chances because we had the ball in the first leg. And he felt like we deserved to win today when it was a complete style of football. So what is it that he's exactly valuing? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. This well, is like, all, yeah. All three losses too. I feel like Barcelona has been able, like all three games have been different and yet yep. Barcelona is still won. Yeah. And, and played better in all three of them. Yeah. Maybe not the maybe, maybe not necessarily the, the Copa del Rey home line, but they, I, I think even that one were you really could argue practical. Barcelona were better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that. they were really practical yeah. and solid defensively, and um, like they played, they played a way we've never seen Barcelona play before, but it got the job done. Um, and so yeah, that's where that's where it's starting to get really frustrating. Is no matter which way we try to play the game. It, it it still isn't falling in our favor and fan I, I mean everybody's looking at this and saying there's a ton of things they would have done differently than Ancelotti and so I think we're coming away yes there were individual poor performances Benzema Carvajal Valverde um, but I think we're coming away saying like Ancelotti most of this is on you no is that the way you're kind of feeling Yeah. And look, he could look, he could come around and turn around and go win the Champions League again and make some incredible substitutions and put in a tactical master class. We're not saying like that's not possible, but in these last especially in the, over the last three games against Xavi's Barcelona, I think Ancelotti has lost that tactical battle and that managerial battle. Look, would I trade losing the Barca three times in a row to win the Champions League? Yeah, I would. And I would yeah. I would celebrate at the end of the year. But again, we analyze the process. We analyze what we see. Um, there are a ton of variables in this. And with regards to like who to blame and stuff, again, you can point out the fact that the board refused to upgrade the squad in key areas. But you also when we talk about the tactics in games like this and getting it wrong against Xavi three times in a row, um, he has the things that are, are in his control or, or who plays, um, the variance in the tactics, the predictability of it. It's just like today, I, I felt like it was maybe a little less predictable in some ways, or at least at the very least, Vinicius actually probably had his best game against Araujo tonight. I mean, we haven't really talked about that yet. He actually got in behind him quite a few times, which was nice. And there was more space and transition to work with. But it was still kind of predictable in that you still have to go through Vinicius on the left and play one-twos with Benzema. And how many times tonight were there just no one in the box? You know, I I was watching this game with my dad, um, which is nice because I didn't I haven't watched game with him in uh, like years, I think. And we were just talking about how he was furious when Kamavinga came off, first of all. Like, he was just absolutely furious. He didn't understand it at all. He was like, why is he taking off our best player? And the whole, and every time, you know, like, there was one time where Nacho actually got it, like, made an overload on the left side. And everyone watching on TV could see it. And he was like, please don't cross. And he crossed it. And you, and if you see the camera pan, and not a single player is in the box. So why did you cross it? There were moments where Vinicius was crossing too or trying like it was there's no one there and we didn't have many players joining the attack and that's why I'm confused because we talk about taking risks but I'm not sure I was confused about that because it's not like we were getting numbers in the box that often there was a lot of space between our lines um and I think that's where you look at the two sides of the coin of Cruz today too didn't misplace any passes actually was really helpful um in passing in transition, he may have been our most reliable passer in those situations. But there was so much space between him and Kamavinga between the lines. And that's probably where Kamavinga, I think, again, this goes back to what I said in the podcast with Lucas. Kamavinga's positioning at the six still isn't great, as great as he was today. 
just put too many there to clean it up a bit and put Kamavinga on the field. And the third midfielder, take your pick. Put Rodrigo on the field. You have one spot left for Fede and Modric and Ceballos. Someone's got to miss out. And Cruz, sorry. Yeah, I mean, and Cruz only had 47 touches in this game. Like, that's astronomically low for, for Cruz. Um, Should be. And, and again, like, you, Carvajal had double the amount of touches, and he's the yeah. last person you want to have the most touches on the field. That's, that's what I'm saying. I think Xavi set up his defensive shape that way and, like, funneled mm. our possession to Carvajal and purposely let Carvajal, like, he pressed everyone else and then let the ball get to Carvajal. And he basically, once they initiated the press there, that's when he coughed up the ball and 23 times, double anybody else. So I think Chavi clearly pinpointed our weakness and went after it. And um, uh, I think part of the reason you have Fede Valverde on the right wing is because he's got the engine to go both ways. But today he didn't go both ways. He never yeah. got up. And he his never touches got up were with, weird. Really his poor. touches were weird. His passes were over hit. Like that one um, where we finally got a break. Betty was on the break and he cuts it back to Benzema and he hits it so hard to Benzema that Benz has to play it to Carvajal rather than being <laughs> able to like do something a little bit more creative. Yeah. Um, there was just countless, countless kind of passes and touches like that from Valverde today. And um, yeah, if you're not going to be able to get right back up the pitch, then taking risks for me is like maybe hedging your bets and keeping three guys high and going for the counter attack instead of just two, you keep yeah. three guys high. And in that type of scenario, I'd rather Rodrigo. And so I don't see where we, where we took risks. Like I just, I, I just don't see it. I don't think maybe at the end of the game when it was just chaotic and open, but I think that that should have happened a lot earlier. Yeah. And uh, I think, and I don't know if this is fully how Carlo justifies it, but this is how I imagine he half, at least half justifies the lineup today. We now have one week and, or sorry, no, this was this our last game before the international break? Yeah. So that's there as a justification. Um, we, Benzema's not going on international duty. This is the last game he can play in a long time. Um, Cruz is not going international duty. Then you have the fact that um, this is basically the last time a lot of these guys can play before before the next home game against Valladolid. And so I wonder if they, that's how they justified it. But I can't. I mean, like that's that's only p- part of it. I think. I think this is the the eleven he rides with, and I think it can't be this unshakable that this is your starting 11. It can't be. And I know Carlo likes to say like, it, you know, it doesn't matter who starts, doesn't matter who comes off the bench. No, I, I completely disagree with that notion. Like this is not basketball where you can sub, you have unlimited subs, you can sub in and out. You can't dig yourself a hole. And also like, you, it also made you not make any subs virtually until the 80th minute in the first like in that Copa clash. I think you need to shake it up a bit. I consider it a great victory that Kamavinga has snuck into the lineup now. That That's a great thing. But I think you need more to trickle through into the lineup. And I think Rodrigo is one of them. The problem is like you don't have the list of options behind Carvajal. But at this at this point, this sounds really radical, but if you put Vinicius Tobias there tonight, is it worse? It can't be worse. If I, if I you know. if if we put you there tonight, is it worse? <laughs> I'm being dead yeah. serious. <laughs> yeah, it's worse. <laughs> Are you sure? What would you have done worse than? Come Carvajal on, don't tonight? don't don't Car- Carvajal that dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Club legend, probably our greatest right back ever, but. We got it. Like this is at like what are you gambling if you play someone else there? How much of a drop off can there be from what we saw today and in the Super Cup and uh, against Liverpool? How much of a drop off can there be from what we've seen from him? This is not Carvajal of 2017. Yeah, I mean it's just 
with Carvajal, it's such a gamble because you'll get these, you'll get it like one in a handful games where he plays lights out, like he did last year, and and Liverpool first leg it, at Liverpool, he was phenomenal. He was one of the best players, but the second leg, his game against Barcelona, even against Espanyol on the weekend, like there's just countless. It's like he's one out of ten, time and time again. And yeah, he'll come up for the big game every now and then if he can get his mind and body right. But it's it's sad to see because he is a Cantarano. He is somebody who's grown up in the system. Like since he was ten years old, there's that famous image of him putting down the new shirt at uh at Valdebebas. And like, yeah, this is exactly what you want. A, a kid from your youth system playing over a decade in the team, winning five Champions Leagues, but at some point it all does come to an end. And I think we're at that stage with Carvalho. Hall. And to your point earlier, like the board needs to be ruthless this summer. And yes, we keep having the excuse. Oh, they have Lucas Vasquez and Carvalho have these long-term contracts. What are you going to do? They don't want to leave. They make really high salaries. Nobody else is going to pay them that find a way, find a way, get it done. Like find a way we got to open up roster spots for that position. And we need to, we need to get younger, younger legs there like that's just the fact of the matter um going back to the point about his touches and how he was involved in this game and how chavi you know wanted to funnel our play there and our touches there in the build-up phase the other thing is that i think we also shot ourselves in the foot various times when we were attacking we were ignoring good runs happening on the left side and forcing it to Benzema and Carvajal on the right side in a few sequences. And I would as go as far as to say is that in that goal, disallowed goal, the Asensio disallowed goal, uh, I think we even got lucky that to even create that chance. I thought the chance was gone because I thought Rodrigo should have played in the run on the left side. I think it was Vinny who was making that overlap. And uh, he didn't. And Benzema had a couple too, where he he went to the right side instead of playing the obvious overload on the left side, which they were they were running free. So I think that we we just made some poor decisions as well in those situations. By the way, like where where were you on the Asensio offside call? I guess it's offsides by a hair. I just I get frustrated by those types of calls because. Never in a million years prior to VAR and prior, yeah, it like, wouldn't have been reviewed. Yeah, and it's it, one, it but just, you can't get mad about it either if it's the right call. Yeah, it's just like when we get. Yeah, I guess it's where do you draw the line? Like I just get frustrated when it's like that minuscule of a offsides call that it really is. That's not what the rule was intended or created for. Yeah, but. It is what it is. Like you have, I I understand that you have to draw the line somewhere. Well, it's one of those things that, when you show me a picture like that, I don't see the offside. To be honest with you, yeah. But then you you're telling me that the line is drawn and it's mathematics and it's physics and it's calculated by a robot. Then what am I going to say? Like, okay, I guess there's some kind of eyelash there that's offside. Can't argue with it, I guess. <laughs> and and. And it's uh, and it's funny. Like my dad jumped up. He's like, "See, it's not offside. They just showed it." The line is like proving that it's offside, and he's like, "See, yeah. it's not offside." <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's what Carlo means, though. But but again, like, uh, I don't want to get into that stuff necessarily. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those calls that definitely would not have been called before the VAR era. This the refereeing stuff. Again, it's not a it's not a top discussion top priority discussion for me, but there were some incidents that I saw after the game that there was one where Sabios is running off ball and Gavi. Gavi comes out of nowhere and just clocks him in the back and there was nothing. Like that's a red card. It's I don't know I don't know. I, I, I so, it boils my blood that this kid gets away with so much shit. This is this may be my uh old man yelling at a cloud moment, but I like we all hate Gavi. Like everyone agrees that Gavi's like a huge dick and just like he's a a little pest that nobody likes. But at the same time, why don't we have that on our team? We need somebody like that on our team. We used to have that with Pepe and Ramos. We used to have guys that like got in their heads and was just a pest and just 
like nonstop running, the intensity, everything. And today I just felt like, oh, everybody, oh, high five. Like, oh, here, let me help you up. Like, I, I know I'm getting like, these are little things that really don't matter. But at the same time, I'm just like, where's La Liga's on the line? Where's like the hot blood? Where's the rivalry? Where's the intensity? Like, yeah, I Barcelona only saw it from it. them tonight. Yeah, not from yeah. us. Yeah, we didn't have it at all. You uh, you could you could even see it. This is now this is getting kind of maybe too philosophical, but the you can see it in the way we celebrated our goals too. Like there was the way that Vinny celebrated the own goal that Aujo had. Uh and their equalizer before halftime, they just celebrated like they won the Champions League. Like it was huge, a huge party. And I and I this goes maybe back to the urgency thing or just the fact that we really didn't uh believe that we we're gonna have a chance of the title race. I don't know. I I got I they, they have to get the Copa del Rey second leg completely different. And I just don't know if I have faith in them to do it. Maybe they treat that one so differently because it's literally something that actually matters and something's on the line for them. Maybe. Do you have any faith in that one? It's tough. Like, given prior evidence right now, there's not reason to have much faith. Um, you got to believe that this team, especially with the mentality that we know most of these guys possess is going to be pissed off and want to prove a point in that Copa del Rey. And it's like their third chance in a short amount of time to do so against Barcelona. But there's a part of me that says Barcelona go on to win that one four games in a row in a short period of time that Barcelona beat Real Madrid. Like it's just not acceptable. We shouldn't, we shouldn't allow it. It's not up to standard. And it's it's we're losing trophies because of it like that's the reality we've now lost la liga and if we lose that game we're gonna lose the copa del rey yeah i think the that like i don't resonate with the message that carla puts out in those press conferences it's something that i criticize barcelona and their fans for a lot after we beat them in the super cup last year or something and they were like claiming moral victory and we were better I was like, okay, that's cool. That's you can have that own your that belief if you want. It's, that's cringy to me. Uh, I would I would hope that Real Madrid never fall into that. And we've done that for two. At least our coach has. I haven't seen the fans agree with him. To be fair, but I, I certainly don't resonate with that message of you know we played well and uh, we deserve to win. Which in the first leg, if you valued possession and not chances created, that that's your measuring stick. Go for it. In this one, I'm not sure what the measuring stick is. You didn't have the possession or more chances. Um, You just had some chances. And the ball maybe sure could have bounced your way on one or two of those, and you could have won this game. But again, what I think you have to do in these situations is look at the good stuff and the bad stuff and eliminate the bad stuff and focus more on the good stuff. And that's what I'm concerned about if Carlo can do or not. And, And I'm skeptical. So I'll just run through like, really quickly and I may miss stuff but there were some things that I thought were good and I think we should Im- continue to take that into the Copa game um, some of our pressing sequences were actually good in this game and um, early on especially we kind of stopped pressing but in the first few minutes of what I thought we did well is we dared Ter Sagan to pass the ball on a man to man high press and we actually got him to to lose the ball in those situations and I think the very first minute, right from the kickoff, essentially, we had a Fede Valverde counterpress that leads to a Benzema shot. Uh, and then Ter Sagan gives the ball away, too, on, under a press. We did, we did that a couple more times before the game ended, but not that much. Our press resistancy um, was good from certain players. It was brutal when it was Carvajal and Militao for the most part. Cruz under pressure was good. Modric under pressure was good. And there was one in particular in the 23rd minute, which was absolutely brilliant from us. The final hurdle, guess what it was? Carvajal runs into the box and fumbles fumbles it and from a great goal scoring position. Um, so there were moments like that where it's all good. We need to we need to just keep increasing the volume of those good moments. 
more of Kamavinga. How about that, uh, how about yeah. that Kamavinga roulette? That was beautiful. I thought so. This is what I liked about Kamavinga tonight. He really, really tried to get the ball forward, and he was comfortable in himself and composed in himself. That if not nothing was on, he could keep the ball and recycle possession. But he would always look vertical first. And he tried to carry the ball forward. He would try to get the ball forward in between the lines, usually to Vinicius. The roulette was awesome. He was good under pressure. His Again, his coverage on both sides was fantastic. And I'm just amazed that he didn't, again, last the whole 90 when we had clear weak spots in the team that needed to be addressed. So more of Camavinga, more of Rodrigo. I would put two of many there to solidify our defensive structure and the space that we've left vulnerable between the lines. And there I say, like, again, I think more of Ceballos or at least earlier Ceballos. I thought he was like right away he came in and was put Gavi in his place a little bit and actually got into Gavi's head. He had this one um, amazing play under pressure in the 80th minute. He keeps it and completely undresses Gavi, and then Gavi just fouls him and hacks him because he's frustrated. He doesn't know how to get the ball off him. I think you need more of Ceballos as well. I think his energy... Uh, 100%. Lucas and I have been talking about this. We're dumbfounded how Ceballos all of a sudden lost yeah. all of his minutes. It makes no it's... sense based on merit. Yeah. I mean, I think that's been one of the most frustrating um, themes of the last month, maybe even two months, is like... Ceballos minutes just fell off a cliff after he was putting man of the match performance after man of the match performance. And even the few minutes he does get, he always plays well. Like he yeah. always plays well. Um, and so it's, it's bewildering, I think to everyone. Um, but one thing, I mean, I guess if we're going, we're at the point now in La Liga where we're going to have to experiment, right? You just mentioned um, uh, Chua Meni and Kamavinga playing together. What I'd like to see, actually, at least one time, like, let's try it out, is a Chua Meni Kamavinga double pivot with Rodrigo as the 10. Yeah, I'd be very I, curious I, I, to see I've that. thought about that quite a bit, too. Uh, I was actually thinking about that right after this game, but it will never happen. You don't think? That's a, no, that's a, because you know we have too many more midfielders. Frustrating? But you know what's going to be even more frustrating? is I don't think we're going to experiment at all. I think... Ancelotti is going to play the same team. He's going to play Benzema nonstop. He's going to play Carvajal. I think, I bet you we don't experiment at all. Until it's, it's mathematically impossible. I mean, we might have to start getting worried about second place soon. No, that's true. Atleti's on fire. Um, What's the gap between Atleti? Oh, oh my God. It's only five point gap. Jeez. That trunk. Yeah, that's the thing. You're going to, he's, Carlos going to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're not yeah. experimenting. You yeah, know it. Not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's not happening. Um, you know why I weirdly had, Thought well, I was kind of optimistic for this game in a weird way for a weird reason because someone one of my friends texted me before the game and said, Hey, for gambling purposes, who should I bet on? And I said, You know what? Out of the three classicos, this is the one I think we'll take least seriously. And for that reason, Carlo may put our B players which actually might increase our chance of winning because I really believe in our B players. So I told him to put a narrow narrow victory on, on Real Madrid. But I, but I also um, saved my own ass and I said, don't gamble. So don't, it's not my fault if nothing happens. But yeah, five-point lead now over Atletico who are hot on our trails. Yeah, I, I don't, think, uh, don't think you can take that lightly at all. Um, what else did you want to talk about in this game? Um, just going through the lineup, I think Courtois was good. The one thing with Courtois, though, that I kept getting frustrated was he kept lumping the ball to no one. And there's that great, uh, great. I think it's because Juan... he was under pressure, though. Yeah, but there's that great uh, Juan Mi Lilo quote where he says, 
it's something along the line. I'm going to butcher like the exact phrasing of it. Um, but it's something along the lines of like the faster you kick the ball up the field, the faster it comes right back at you. I thought that was and, a pep quote. No, that's 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 his assist, his former assistant. Uh, okay. Um, and it's it's true. It that that's what happened today. Like Courtois just lumped the field up, up, lumped the ball up the field to no one, and it just came right back down our throats. And I thought he was guilty of that. Um, Rudiger was also guilty of that. Rudiger only completed one of his seven long long balls today. Mm. Um, I thought Rudiger struggled under the press. It was kind of a back to Rudiger at the start of the year type of performance, in my opinion. Um, and uh, and I don't know. I mean, you mentioned Cruz and Modric having like doing well under the press. I agree, but I just felt like they never really stamped their authority on this match. It never really got going, and both of them only had. Uh, I think Cruz was forty seven and or forty two, and Modric was forty nine touches. Like that's yeah. not a lot of touches for those two. Yeah, well, my my take on that is that I don't think those two players are built to play this way. I've said it many times, like with Cruz, especially like when he was chasing shadows against Chelsea a couple years ago, not last year, whenever that was during the pandemic when we were playing behind closed doors. Like he's not meant to chase shadows as a footballer. Like Cruz and Mordor should be having the ball a lot see their influence they can be press resistant and get the ball in transition but then that's the extent of their influence is get the ball out of pressure and then get the ball to Vinicius you need them on the ball more to to see that um Courtois throws as we've said much better than he the ball at his feet he had a couple really nice long heaves to Benzema um that I thought were good I I also had a I wanted to just make a note on Nacho. A player who obviously had a couple bad moments because he almost won on a red card. He had that one nasty challenge and I I was at Araujo in the first half. He gets the yellow for that. And then he had another one where he got away with um His it wasn't an cross. elbow but kind of a swipe yeah. on Rafinha kind of thing. So so anyways, my point is a, a player of on the verge of a red card. Other than that, I actually thought he was pretty good. Um Yeah. And I well and I thought Rafinha was probably Barcelona's best player. Like yeah. I've been impressed with him. I coming into the season, I didn't think Rafinha was that good. And I and I wasn't surprised to see him get dropped to the bench and like my just overall reading of him as a player, I didn't rank him that highly, but over the last few months, he's changed my opinion. And today, especially, I thought he was probably Bar- one of Barcelona's best players. He and Dembele and Vinicius all have something in common. The fan bases either hate or love them. And that's because they're all high-volume players. So depending on how you perceive it, they make a lot of mistakes or they break lines and create chances. And, uh, and I think that's where his value comes in as well. But yeah, I thought... I mean, Nacho had a lot of key moments too, where you remember that touch he got in the 51st minute where the diagonal cross comes in. And if he doesn't get that touch in, Rafinha's wide open at the far post. He gets a shot in. Nacho intercepts it. He had another great challenge on Lewandowski in the box in the second half. Um, stood his ground on rare. And this is the thing about Barcelona too. Like Araujo plays right back. So by that nature, the only offense they get in terms of fullbacks is Baldi on the other side because Araujo doesn't go up the field much and he plays right back. A couple of times he did get up, not just to his ground against him. So, yeah, again, a player on the verge of a red card, but he also does some good things. One like one thing I would nitpick is like he he let Rafinha go side of him once behind him on a run in behind in the first half. But he recovered. He sprinted back and won the ball, like on that mistake, same mistake. So I, I like it was another good Nacho performance. Another guy I think we we don't have to drag in a performance like this. Well, and the point you made on Araujo too, playing at right back is we should be doing the same thing that Xavi's doing to Carvajal. Like Araujo's not of all the Barcelona players, he's a guy I would let be on the ball and try to make decisions and try to carry the ball up the field or make a pass. Like 
he's a guy who would try and funnel everything through for Barcelona so that he'll cough up possession for us. And I thought there were a couple of times where Vinicius just really didn't make any effort um, when he was defending him. Like he just kind of let him go pretty easily. Yeah, he, he didn't at all. It yeah, was kind of so, weird to see actually. Like this is a guy I think we Araujo at right back, like, take advantage of some of his deficiencies in that position. Like, yes, he's a monster defending and can keep up with Vinicius athletically, but he's not that great on the ball. So like, let's force him on the ball and let's force him to make decisions and take advantage of him that way. He, um, it's also interesting that I feel like these two are going to have like a decade of classicals against each other. And then at the end, they're just kind of have a kind of like a, a round table discussion after their careers are over, just talking about it. And it feels like they have a lot of respect for each other. Every single duel is concludes with a high five between the two. It's kind of cool to see. Um, I didn't love that. <laughs> well, I'm just like, you know, the respect is there. It's not like a, it's not like a violent, um, like even in the press conferences, I mean, I haven't heard Vinicius speak, but I hope speaks very highly about Vinicius all the time in the press in pressers and stuff. But uh, on to another point, how much do you think Fran Garcia makes a difference in a game like this? Well, have you seen that graphic that going around that's doing the rounds on mm-hmm. like? So let me let me see if I can find it. But there's a graphic going around on like the highest progressive. I think it's progressive pass combined passes plus carries. I think that's what it was, or it's just mm-hmm. carries progressive distance. Um, and there's two people who sit at the top of the table, Vinicius at number one and Fran Garcia at number two. Hmm. And so I honestly believe that if this guy gets a true opportunity, I think he'll do pretty well. Like, I hope he's not just uh signing where he gets he comes back and then he plays scrap minutes and like gets a game here and there like i'd like to see him get a real opportunity because i think he is a quality player his numbers are really good um especially offensively like he's he's got the speed the ability the technical quality to be a high volume offensive threat overlapping fullback like kind of your traditional bomb up the left side left back um, and it'd be, I mean, it'd be interesting to see like two guys who provide those types of numbers on the same flank. Yeah, that, that, that is really interesting. I mean, for today's sake, um, and again, it's, this is not, I think, uh, uh, irrelevant discussion to have because Fran Garcia is coming next summer, this summer. Um, I think in a game like this, he keeps Rafinha pinned a little bit more because we had a lot of space to make overloads in this game. And again, this is kind of where a player like Chuomeni comes in. Matt's sharing the graph, share screen. There you go. Above Mbappe, above Saka, above Nico Williams, like, it's Vinicius and Junior and Fran Garcia. Uh, it's progressive carries is the metric. So, yeah, I mean, based on based on that, but also just we know Fran Garcia pretty well now after a couple of years at Rio. I think it's I think in a game like this, he helps put more pressure on Arojo, who was actually funny enough that Arojo was actually we got isos Vinny versus Araujo where they didn't have many people converging on Vinny it was just one on one and Vinny did get the better of him today and I think if you add Fran Garcia's overloads in that dynamic I think you can actually create something and keep Rafinha pinned a little bit more and also limit Araujo maybe from bringing the ball out of the back on rare occasions so it's it's a point worth looking at I don't know how much Carlo was thinking about this stuff to be honest I I really don't know I think Carvajal uh, do you think Carlo just Closes his book tonight. And he's like, great performance. We can just uh, <laughs> copy and paste this for a- April 2nd, April 5th, whenever it is. Remains to be seen. God, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just trying to do a quick. I, I just want to uh, note, I I thought Frankie was really good tonight. I think Frankie hurt us with his passing. 
Yeah, he's been good for a while now. I think he hurt us in the last two Classicos too. Yeah. Um. Here's one last thing. When did we sign Eden Hazard? 2019? Yeah. We played 11 Classicos since signing him. He hasn't played any of them. That stat over, will remain over true Over a thousand forever. minutes. Unbelievable. One of those one of those things that you would never believe it if you told us this when we signed him. Never not in only, a million years. Not only is he the worst transfer in Real Madrid history, but he might be the worst t- transfer in football history. I th- I think he has to be. Unless you, you maybe factor in Coutinho, but Coutinho played. <laughs> yeah. I like so Coutinho actually played. And, and, and Hazard's still... wages are way higher than Coutinho's. Yeah. I think he has to be because of salary, price tag, and disaster ratio. Too. <laughs> yeah, expectations, all that stuff. He has to be. Maybe there's one that we're missing and we're not thinking clearly. I don't know, but yeah, I'm pretty fried at this point. Um, <laughs> do you do you care to talk about anything else? Or do you, are you okay to call it a Sunday night? I think we're good. All right. Uh, just a note that a lot of people have been messaging us about whether we're not... They, they're interested in doing a London podcast. We are going to be in London at Stamford Bridge for that second leg against Chelsea. I just don't know with logistics yet in terms of um, how many days we're going to be in London yet. So if there's enough interest, we might swing it. I think there's almost been enough interest now, but if there's enough interest, just send us a DM, preferably on Patreon, because if you send us a message on social media, it's never going to be seen. So preferably message us on patreon and tell us if you're interested in that and we're, we'll uh, keep you in the loop we'll put you on an email list to notify if we're going to do something matt are you and i going to be back anytime soon we'll figure something out during the international break maybe yeah we'll think of something cook up i actually have some ideas i wanted to run by you um okay that i think maybe we can talk about so also housekeeping lucas and i will be back eldia Despues tomorrow that'll be interesting uh, and yeah, enjoy the international break. Thanks for suffering with us tonight. Appreciate you guys. Matt, thank you. We'll talk Thanks soon. Again. Take care. Peace. Yep. Thanks for listening, guys. And before we wrap it up here and send you along on your way, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid who do so much to support the show. Thank you guys for being on this journey with us and being a part of this ever-growing Real Madrid family. If you pledge $10 or more, not only do you get access to every single bonus content we do, and not only do you get guaranteed responses to your questions, but you also get a specific shout-out on the podcast. So shout-out to these $10 plus patrons as follows. Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Way Pairing, Wamik Jamal, Tobias Royal Botcher, Talib Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Sumanchu Singh, Sheikh Atiri, Shamil, Shabal Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorzano, Samuel Justin, Samer Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Saad Omar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Diafari, Astro Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, uh, and then we got Nelson Mazariego, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavronakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, J- Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Kohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Connor Mc- McMorrow, Con P. Christian Toff, Christian Acosta, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Bashar, Arnab Mukherjee, Armin Gashi, Armando L, Anirudh Singh, Andres Silvestre, Ananya Kumar, Alex Steiberg, Alex Rose, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Ramtin Magrur, Manaf Al Haddad, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. We love you guys so much. Thank you, and Hanamarit.